guys, welcome back to another The Arsenio Buck Show podcast. Man, I rarely do podcasts this late. It's like 7 at night. I kid you not. But of course, I upload them in advance. But man, when you get a new book, when I get a new book, it just starts rolling. I become more interested. And not only that, guys, I have this on my iBooks, and I'm just reading through it, but I'm also listening to it. Because I might listen to something different from what I'm reading. This is what I love about representational uh, systems. Got to find your favorite way of learning. And so, why the eighth habit? Well, guys, remember Gary Vee like two years ago? I don't watch him anymore. But he was talking about voice and how voice was going to be especially important. Stephen Covey, he wrote this in his book. He said, being effective as individuals and organizations are, is no longer optional in today's world. Right, it's the, pl- it's the price of entry. But surviving, thriving, innovating, and excelling? This will require us to build and reach way beyond just being effective. What does that mean? Well, someone who's effective is someone that goes to work, does their job, they come home, that's it. That's being effective. Guys, if you're one of the 400 million people who have lost their jobs at some point throughout the, or maybe I don't know how many people are employed, to be honest with you, because if we factor in the likes of India, Bangladesh, the majority of the continent of Africa, what's happening out there, you know, all down South America, it could be well over 700 million possibly. Because India alone, they're saying that there are at least seven, uh, 700 million who, who are homeless. So, Just being effective is no longer suitable. See, guys, in this era, it's an era of greatness, fulfillment, passionate execution. You got to be able to contribute significantly. Guys, if I didn't, guys, I'm looking at these big ass books over here. We're talking about 1,200 pages worth right over there. I become those books. I teach and I become those books. Now, that's a skill set I had to develop. If I didn't teach and like learned that over there, that's just on the edge of my bed, I would not be going to another province, possibly even right now. If you guys are listening to this right now, I could be on a bus heading four hours to another province to teach just that. But if I didn't learn that skill set, like about 90 to 95% of teachers in Thailand do not know that specific skill set. I wouldn't have an additional X amount of income. No way. I probably would have lost out on anywhere between $5,000 and $10,000 to this point. Maybe even more. I'm just giving a guesstimate. Do you guys understand what I'm saying? That's contribution. See, you guys are going to have to... It's not even about degrees anymore. Okay? It's about significance. That's what's going to bring you... To success. That's what's going to tap you into that human genius, that motivation, and what we can actually call voice. See, that requires a new mindset, a new skill set, a new a new tool set, a new habit. That's what voice is. You know, going back into uh, another um, what is it? Another quote he has said in here, which is really, really interesting. Before I give you some stories, he said the eighth habit represents the pathway to the enormous, uh, uh, the enormously promising side of today's reality. It stands in stark contrast to the pain and frustration he's been describing, or I've been describing in the last two possible podcasts. Remember, going over our pains, right? In fact, it's a timeless reality. See, it is the voice of human spirit, full of hope and intelligence, resilience by nature, boundless in its potential to serve the common good. See, this voice also encompasses the soul of organizations that will survive, thrive, and profoundly impact the future of the world. Think about all the voices. Think about the best companies in the world. Jack Ma. He sent shockwaves. Yes, I know a lot of people would, you know, deter, you know, say, oh, I don't think that's a good example. Guys, I'm talking about voice here. Think about, think about the most prolific voices out there. People who could lead, and I'm talking lead and lead and lead. Justin Trudeau, Prime Minister of Canada, he has that. There are a number of them out there. I, I don't know. I don't know so, many, so much about politics or Prime Ministers, but his voice and his way to lead is unfathomable. Eric Thomas, he's the best. He is the number one. 
people say, oh, it's just a motivational speech. No. What he says and how he says it hits me and has hit me in more ways than any other person who has lived in the last 150 years. Straight up. Like, straight up. And Trent Shelton's another one because I just mentioned his podcast. Straight up. Does that make sense, guys? You gotta have a proficient, okay? And you need to have, like, an an above and beyond voice to be able to lead companies, lead people, lead a household, lead a relationship, lead friendships, lead people who look up to you. This is what's happening with me right now. Why do you guys, why why is it, dude, why is it that on my, oh my God, I think my ESL podcast today, for some reason, Bangkok's just skyrocketing. But why is it that people all around the world listen to my podcast? Is it because I'm just crazy as hell? Is it because I speak crazy? It's because my voice, they hear that passionate execution. See, I'm going to give you an example of not so passionate execution. The eighth habit represents the pathway to the enormously promising... Shut the fuck up! That's not passionate. Some people say, oh, you got too much energy. I am energy. We are all energy. There's no such thing as having too much energy. But I'm passionate about what I do. I didn't have this voice before. Go back to the podcast from the beginning. I sound like a tub of dog shit. But now I developed it. See, guys, this is going to require us, all of us, finding our voices again. Look, learning how to talk to one another. This is, oh my God, this is going to be the most life-changing series for you guys. This season, season six, will be the most life-changing series for all of you. Why? Because, again, learning how to talk to one another. Have you ever met someone? I don't know about you guys, but have you ever met someone and you're like, holy shit? Like, damn, I can't believe, who the hell was that? Just knocked your socks off, just like that. I have met a couple of Americans in the past who were like that. Um, Australia, I don't remember anything. Um, People at the airport, not so, I think a couple of times. But there have been a couple of guys that I've met and a couple of women. I'm like, oh my God, she is a ton of amazing energy. Her voice and the way she could lead is phenomenal. Have you met people like that? Well, that's what we need to develop. Inside, outside. See, there's a conversation going on today, right? That wasn't happening five years ago. Or by maybe before the Industrial Revolution, right? So if we look at it, internet, World Wide Web, this conversation, man, it's vast. It's multifaceted, okay? It's about a billion years of pent-up hopes and fears and dreams, That are now in double helixes. And you know what? Looking back on it. Looking back at it. I'm talking about the ancient times. The elemental. The sacred. All that craziness. Right? This is what the era is that we are living in right now. There are millions upon millions. Helixes. Deja vu. You name it. Of conversations happening all around the world. Okay, we're finding our voice online, but I'm talking about how to find your voice speaking to a a human being. Guys, in terms of what I've been doing, okay. All right. I mean, I've been I've been doing an amazing job in terms of writing and stuff. But what about the voice? How did I develop that? I'm going to give you a story. There was a guy by the name of Muhammad Yunus. Okay. And he wrote this excerpt, and I thought this is one of the most fascinating things. It's going to be a little bit long. It's going to be a little bit long. But again, this is back, obviously, in the 20th century. So let's let's listen to this. This is going to be a good one. All right? So you guys sit back, and you listen to this bad boy. It all started 25 years ago. He said he was teaching economics at a university in Bangladesh. The country was in the middle of famine. Famine meaning starvation for any of you ESLers out there. He said he felt terrible. Here he was, teaching the elegant theories of economics in the classroom with all the enthusiasm of a brand new PhD from the United States. But when he would walk out of the classroom, he would see skeletons all around him. People waiting to die. Wow. 
He said he felt that whatever he had learned, whatever he was teaching was all make-believe stories. All a bunch of bullshit. With no meaning for people's lives. So he started trying to find out how people lived in the village next door to the university campus. He said he wanted to find out whether there was anything he could do as a human being to delay or stop the death. Even for one single person. Guys, I'm talking this guy had death around him, period. He said he abandoned the bird's eyed view. That lets you obviously see everything from above from the sky. He said he assumed a worm's eye view. Trying to find whatever comes right in front of us. Smell it. Touch it. See if you could do something about it. So one particular incident took him just in a new direction. In in totality. He said he met a woman who was making bamboo stools. And after a long discussion with her. He found out that she made only two U.S. pennies a day. Two U.S. pennies a day. I think that's that's probably below 25 stong for any folks out here that listen to me in Thailand. Just think of your currency and just like make that like a a, a one hundredth or a two hundred, whatever. Yep. Anyways, let's keep going. He said he couldn't believe anybody could work so hard and make such beautiful bamboo stools, yet make such a tiny amount of profit. He said that she explained to him, and it's because that she didn't have the money to buy the bamboo to make the stools. She had to borrow from the trader, and the trader imposed the condition that she would have to sell the product to him alone at a price that he decided. And that explains the two fucking pennies, obviously. So she was virtually bonded to labor to this person. And how much did the bamboo cost? She said, oh, about 20 cents for a very good one, 25 cents. So, of course, Muhammad at the time, he he thought, man, people suffer for 20 cents and there is nothing anyone can do about it. So he started debating whether he should give her 20 cents. But then he gave he came up with uh, with another idea. He said, let me make a list of people who needed that kind of money. So he took a student of, my, uh, of his and he went around the village for several days and came up with a list of 42 such people. When he added up the total of amount that was needed, he got the biggest shock of his life. It added up to 27 fucking dollars. He felt ashamed of himself for being part of a society which could not provide even $27 to 42 hard-working, skilled human beings. So to escape that shame, he took the money out of his pocket and gave it to his student. And he said, you take this money and give it to those 42 people that we met and tell them this is a loan. But they can pay me back whenever they are able to. In the meantime, they can sell their products wherever they can get a good price. So after receiving that money, they were super excited. Obviously, 42 people, $27, there's no more two fucking cents. They're getting, oh my god, I can't do the math, but let's just say over 50 fucking cents now. Holy shit. And so when he saw that excitement, it made him think, man, what do I do now? So he thought of the Brink Branch, right? Which was located on the campus of the university. And he went to the manager and suggested he lend him the money to the poor people that he had met in the village. So he fell from the sky. He said, you are crazy. It's impossible. How could we lend money to poor people? Oh, my goodness gracious. Crazy, huh? Let me repeat that. The motherfucker, the manager at the bank said, you are crazy. It's impossible. How could we lend money to poor people? They are not credit worthy. So, of course, Muhammad, he pled with him and said, you know what? At least give it a try. Find out. It's only a small amount of money. He said, no, our rules don't permit it. They cannot offer collateral, and such a tiny amount is not worth lending. He suggested that, hey, you know what? Oh, these high officials in the banking hierarchy in Bangladesh, you know how these fuckers are, right? So he took his advice, and he went to the people who, who matter in the banking section. So he went up higher. Everybody told him the same thing. So finally, after several days of running around, he offered himself a, he offered himself as a guarantor i'll guarantee the loan i'll sign whatever they want me to sign and they can give me the money and i'll give it to the people i want to 
Whoa. That motherfucker, he assumed all responsibility for those 42 people. So then, that was the beginning. They warned him repeatedly that the poor people who receive money will never pay it back. And Muhammad said, you know what, I'll take that chance. And the surprising thing was, they they repaid him every penny, those poor people. He got really excited, came to the manager and said, look! They paid me. There's no problem. But he said, oh, no. They're just fooling you. Soon they will take more money and never pay you back. You see what I mean? That's poverty mindset. Have we heard that before? We've all heard that so many times. He says, so he gave them more money and they paid him back. And he told it to him. But he said, well, maybe you can do this in one village, but you can't do it in two villages. It won't work. So he went to two villages and it worked. So it became a kind of struggle between him and the bank manager and his colleagues in the highest positions. They kept going back and forth. They kept saying that at a larger number, five villages, no way. It's going to show. These poor people are not worth it. They're not going to be able to do it. See, this is called extended trust going back to the Stephen Covey, right? So he did it in five villages, and it only showed that everybody paid back. Still, those motherfuckers in the bank, they didn't give up. They said 10 villages, 50 villages, 100 villages. And so it became a kind of contest between them and him. He came up with the results, and he couldn't deny it. But they would not accept it. Because they are trained to believe that poor people are unreliable. So luckily he wasn't trained the way he could believe whatever he was seeing. He didn't have the bird's eye. He had the worm eye. He didn't have the bird's eye. He had the worm eye. You know, they were just blinded. Those banking managers, they were completely blinded. So to finish that up. And to finish off this story, finally, he had thought, what am I trying to convince them? Why am I trying to convince these motherfuckers? I went from one village to two to five to ten to fifty to a hundred. What am I doing? But at the same time, Muhammad, he was totally convinced that poor people can take money and pay it back. So he said, why don't we set up a separate bank? Why don't we set up a separate bank? That excited him. See, he went higher thinking. And he wrote down the proposal and went to the government to get the permission to set up the bank. Took him about two years to convince the motherfucking government. But on October 2nd of 1983, they had become a bank. A formal independent bank. And what excitement for all of them now that they had their own bank. And they could expand as they wished. And he said, we expand or and expand we did. The last quote was, when you are inspired by some great purpose, some extraordinary project, all your thoughts break their bounds. Your mind transcends limitations. Your consciousness expands in every direction. And you find yourself in a new, great, and wonderful world. Remember I told you at the end of that podcast last Thursday. Last Thursday, people. Remember I said. I said, if you don't have something, make someone else get it. Now, Muhammad, he had money. But he was just sick and tired of seeing people dying just withering off. This was Bangladesh in the 20th century, guys. It's happening now, but it was far worse before. We know the famine that had hit, of course, India in the 1940s. But going back to this specific story, he said, man, what can I do about this? He saw the tremendous talent, like I just told you in the earlier in the podcast. He saw the tremendous talent of one specific individual and said, you are being grossly underpaid. See, a lot of people and a lot of you right now, you're being grossly underpaid, although you have a tremendous amount of talent. Hmm. Kind of rings a bell, doesn't it? And so then he said, you know what? Let me figure this out. 
And he said, you know what? I'm going to be responsible. I'm going to make the greatest impact in the world. He got that loan and people were saying, no, 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 no. Why? Because they already had a preconceived notion of that group of people. They could not pay it back. And then what ended up happening after that is history. Guys, this is the beauty. This is the beauty of not only extending trust, but to going up and beyond of that high purpose. We're talking going far beyond that. He became the voice of those people who didn't have a voice. Day after day, week after week, month after month, convincing the fucking government. Can you imagine the voice he had to have at that time to convince the government? And in 1983, they became a bank. Who would have ever thought? I'm telling you guys, why the eighth habit? This voice? And the way I even told that story? Hear it. Hear it deeply. Because we're going to keep on moving ahead with this bad boy. So guys, happy Monday. Stay tuned for more. Over and out.